I want you to think of the last skill that you learned. Take a moment. I'll still be here for you. Feel free to pause this video and think about that last skill that you learned. Got it? I want you to answer this question. How did you master that skill? While you think of that, allow me to reintroduce myself. My name is Vanessa Alzate, the founder and CEO of Anchor Training, a custom instructional design development agency, as well as an ID staff augmentation agency. Really have a love for marketing and social media and utilizing what works there in your next training. Now that you've had some time to think, I am pretty sure practice is how many of you answered my question. In order to master the skill, you just kept doing it over and over and over again and you eventually mastered it. Often I hear from customers that their training didn't work because their employees are still doing the same thing over and over and over again. They never actually learned. And when I stopped to actually look at the content that they are utilizing for training, it doesn't really ha have opportunities for practice and for that repetition and to really build up that skill. It's a muscle that you have to build over time. I want you to think about that last training that you were complaining about that didn't work. Was there enough practice built in during and after the training? So this is why our second pillar in the anchor training learning content pillars is activate. You need to activate the brain to practice the skill. You need to also inspire action and promote that repetition and practicing of that skill. And we know that without practice and action, you're not going to change behavior. And while there may be exceptions to the rule, more often than not, without practice, I personally don't change my behavior. There are certain things that I do now instinctively because I've repeated that action over and over and over again. And that's what we want for training, right? You build up those muscles. So let's talk about how you can put that activate principle into your next training content. When you are thinking about your content and designing your next training, I want you to think of this cycle. Educate, activity, and reflect. What is the activity that you can use to support the learning? For example, if you're creating a training on unconscious bias, I would put in an activity where we have nine different pictures, nine different groups of people, and I would ask you, without stopping yourself, totally that first thought that comes to your head, write down one word to describe what you are seeing when you're seeing that picture. And that activity is going to help you solidify the content that you're educating. Likely you were talking before, you'll be talking after, about the stereotypes and you know how your brain automatically creates these shortcuts, right? So stereotypes start to build because you have so much stuff to process in your brain that your brain naturally creates shortcuts. So it starts to do the same thing based on the people that you are seeing. Everyone has bias. One thing that we just said at a training that we just did a masterclass for our Anchored ID Collective, where we talked about how your identity shows up when you're developing content as an instructional designer, as you're a freelancer, is the fact that if you have a brain, you have bias because your brain is constantly making those shortcuts. And so you're probably making that same connection in your unconscious bias training. And while you may talk the talk and you may say the things, you have to actually show them how their brain has bias. And that's how you could really drill in the point. And and then from there, you can, you know, talk about how you help to, you know, break the bias and, and uncover some of those biases. If you are training on something such as a new software, then <laughs> First of all, your girl loves a good software training. And I would say the best thing hands down is to have them practice, but not only in the class, like in the perfect environment, but also take a sheet of activities, right? Take a, have a whole workbook of um, activities, a whole workbook of scenarios, real scenarios, and have them practice them throughout the day. Actually practice it at their desk, right? When they have all the distractions around, their team's channel is popping up, right? They're getting all these IMs from people, all their requests. That is actually, real life. And so I want you to practice doing the tasks that I'm asking you to do when real life is happening around you, right? So you can actually go and like remember what it is that you're doing. You can, you know, work on putting away those distractions to really focus on the information that you're entering into the system, whatever you might be doing. So if you have access, and what I always love to ask whenever I'm doing software training is, is there access to demo accounts or a sandbox and things like that? And if I do have that access, I want to create activities to have the learners practice in those systems. I don't love for them to play in the live system because I don't want them to mess up real data. So I really do recommend anytime you're rolling out software um, to try to have some sort of sandbox situation for people to practice. And the more realistic, the better. If you're talking about how to train on difficult conversations, this is a skill that you just kind of have to practice over and over and over again. And you have to be kind of in the situation of having to have difficult conversations in order to really understand all that goes into difficult conversations. In that case, I am going to 
recommend having an activity where you at least practice with another manager and role playing that difficult conversation, right? And really make it as real life as possible. And reminding everyone that is participating in role plays, role plays only work if you are going to take them seriously. If you're not going to take them seriously and really act as if, you know, this is a real life situation that you are dealing with, Role plays are honestly worthless. <laughs> there we go. She said it. Spicy take. But if you're not actually going to act as if you are, you know, the one receiving feedback, what you would say or how you would tense, then you're not going to always get that real world practice. That would be my one caveat with role plays, but I do find them to be one of the best things that you can do, especially when you're talking about things like sales training, right? So let's say that you're talking about sales training and you're talking about overcoming objections. Well, I'm going to pair a lead sales rep, right? Someone that's been, you know, like, like your closer, you're like million dollar rep with your new rep and ask them to, you know, role play overcoming objections. Then your, you know, your million dollar rep, the rep that has been around for a while, they can share tips and tricks. And they've seen so many different situations when they were trying to overcome objections that they should be able to naturally role play and really show the new employee what it's really going to be like when you're going to have to overcome objections and what real life objections are out there and just continuously you know practice that so maybe it's you have a cohort that's together and you know once a week or once every two weeks they're getting together and they're practicing these different skills so that way they're practicing in a safe environment where they can also get feedback as opposed to learning the skill by <laughs> maybe failing in front of a potential customer and losing the sale. These are some examples, but let me share with you one example that we are actually doing right now with one of our clients. So we're working with the client to help completely overhaul their fitness coach training. And a lot of their training has to happen asynchronously, so completely on their own, just because of the nature of the business. When we get to the content, when we're talking about being on the mic in front of the class and really leading the class, how is it that, you know, we can get that practice? How can we get them to really reflect on what they're seeing, to really practice a skill? Being good on the mic is something that you kind of, it's a muscle that you build when you are constantly in front of a classroom. So we talked about, well, what about, you know, during their initial onboarding, we have them record themselves. They pull out their camera, they pull out their phone, and they record themselves going through a class as if, you know, on the mic. And then they watch it back and they have some reflection opportunities. And if you actually have a cohort together, share them out with your, uh, with the, uh, with their peers and ask for feedback, right? Part of the activity is sharing it and asking for feedback. Or if you have a community or like a, you know, a little Facebook group or something like that for the cohort, have them post it there and then people provide them feedback. This is a way to be able to get that feedback in a more asynchronous, remote, hybrid type of situation. If you're interested in learning more about the anchored learning content pillars and social media principles and how to apply it to your training specifically, or you wanna talk about how you can get an anchored set of hands on your next project, make sure you click the link down below. I would love to have that conversation with you. And of course, we'd love to talk all things TikTok and how you could apply it to your next training. Friends, thank you so much for watching and I'll see you in our next video. Bye.